of uh, young adolescents and older adolescents uh, trying to figure out ways to trying to figure out ways to uh, bring gang violence to a minimum in the city of Springfield. Um, so we work with a lot of gang members, um, trying to unite them on the struggle of trying to play tug of war with them. So we do a lot of peace treaty and peace talks uh, around gang violence and the history of, uh, of gangs. Um, but then the murder of uh, Mike Brown happened, so we wrapped around uh, things around that and how can we fight police brutality within our city as well. And BLM 4 and 3 has been the movement. We have arrived. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to start and just share this um, video. Um, so please pay attention. <laughs> I want to try my quit because we all out here for the same reason. And we do got the people that's trying to sign it more. So for two minutes, we're going to try for two minutes just because we are together. For two minutes, we're going to try to do the solid one thing. And after two minutes, we're going to turn the shit back up. We're going to start this solid thing right now. Let's go. Solid march. Somebody keep that two minutes. Somebody keep that two minutes. You stop us walk out. Come on, stop all the things. Let's go. Michael Brown was murdered by Ferguson, Missouri police officer Darren Wilson. Brown was 18 and unarmed. His body was left in the street for four and a half hours. In the two months since, protesters took to the streets day and night. With Decolonized Media Collective, I was able to travel to Ferguson during Ferguson October. This film shows one night of protests. Go. We get silently. March, march. We're silently marching. Hey, make a hole, y'all. Make a hole. Make a hole. Hey, make a hole. Protesters have been taking since Brown was murdered. Fight back! 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 Fight back!
Protesting in front of the Ferguson Police Department, we then moved on to the neighborhood of Shaw, where Von Derek Myers Jr. was murdered on Wednesday, October 8th, two days before we arrived in Ferguson. We marched from Shaw Boulevard and Clem Street, the site of Von Derek Myers Jr.'s murder, to Graham Boulevard. Thank you. 
We must, we must love each other and respect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and respect each other. We must love each other and respect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. So the people that are here also went down to Ferguson in two separate um, kind of rounds. So um, Vanguard Movement got there, I think, the day after um, Decolonized Media Collective got down. Um, and um, so I, I, I'll speak for a couple minutes about, like, I guess, my experience in Ferguson. And I think um, the video did a really beautiful job of like portraying um, that like literally people are walking around saying, hands up, don't shoot, and the response is, just an incredible amount of uh, militarized police force response um, with helicopters and SWAT teams and Bearcats and um, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of officers. Uh, 
So on the night of October um, 12th, um, I was part of, um, we, we were all, I think, part of the march um, that went from Mike Brown's memorial to the Ferguson Police Department, and then from the Ferguson Police Department to Shaw and Clem, where Von Derrick Myers Jr. was killed um, just a few days before um, thousands of people converged in Ferguson for Ferguson October. And Von Derrick Myers Jr. was shot 17 times um, for holding a sandwich that Ferguson police said was actually a gun. Um, so his um, assassination was a lot more recent, and I think the police really didn't want people in that area. So for us to get to Shaw and Clem, um, you know, we drove nearby and there were streets blockaded off every direction for like four streets with flares. There were helicopters circling overhead. Um, we had to park and go through like all of these like back alleys and we got to the street. And I think the thing like for me was just like these memorials, it's just a couple teddy bears on the street. Like it's just because people like refuse to go home that we even know, like that we even remember Von Derrick's name, that we remember Mike Brown's name, like Hadima Powell's name. Um, and and like the police really don't want that to happen. So we got to Shaw and Clem um, with this small memorial um, and organizers um, had asked us to start walking and we marched several blocks down to um, a local quick trip gas station. And when we were like a block away from that, we, you know, somebody pointed it out and the Bearcat was there, the little tank um, started rolling by with like a caravan of like 10 police cars. Um, and, um, and like we know that these officers have no problem killing black people. Um, so when we got to the gas station, organizers asked us to hold four and a half minutes of silence um, for the four and a half hours that Mike Brown's body lay on the street. And as we sat, or as we stood in silence, um, the SWAT team just started lining up across from us, like you saw. And um, one of their intimidation tactics is to just beat their like batons and advance toward you like in this way, um, which is terrible. Um, so after that, the uh, organizers asked us to, to do an act of civil disobedience and sit down and link arms in front of the gas station, which is symbolic for many reasons. Um, the gas station, a gas station was burned down after Mike Brown's death, um, and he was also accused of like robbing this gas station. Um, so we sat with our arms linked, um, about 200 people, and then eventually 19 of us were arrested um, and held for over 16 hours and transferred to like two different police departments. and. Um, um, and moved around um, while we were there. Um, and the first person who um, was arrested at that march um, was a sister named Makia Green, who was from Rochester, New York. And she was up, up, up against the, the wall of the Quick Trip gas station. And as police started like beating her head, they took their um, riot shield and covered it so that the only closest media person couldn't catch on film what was happening. And um, he caught some of it and ended up being pepper sprayed in the face. Um, even as a journalist. Um, so those are the conditions, and knowing that um, people are still out there marching every single day. Um, and that's like courage like that I can't even like begin to fathom. Um, so for me, like experiencing all that when we came back, it was like we have to, um, we have to do something um, more here. Um, so that was a little bit of my experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sakana, just to remind folks. And I realized that I didn't explain what Decolonized Media Collective is. And so um, we're a student of color activist group on campus. Um, and so as we went and we planned this trip, because we realized that we need to get off of our ivory tower, we need to leave our college campus because we need to go into black and brown communities where we definitely relate from, because we come from black and brown communities, and organize and support and help these folks who called out for a call of action and a national call for folks to get involved. So we went to Ferguson, and I can just say that it was a very um, beautiful experience, but also a very traumatic experience and a very powerful experience. Um, the love that the folks in Ferguson have given to us still stays in my heart, and it's still very much a piece of home to me. And I just want people to realize that what the media shows, the mainstream media is showing, is propaganda, and is really telling folks to believe that black and brown folks are demons, or demonizing them, and in reality, that is not the truth. And another thing that I just want to talk about is the role of women and youth in the movement. 
Um, a lot of people do not recognize women and youth as being parts of the movement, when in reality, we are really the backbones of the movement. And I just wanted to talk about, specifically for women as well, people call women the backbone of, of movements, but they're also the strategizers. They're the long-haul revolutionary runners. They are the ones who birth humanity, and they're also the ones who feed us, clothe us. So when young people in Ferguson were cold, the women went out to go find um, clothing for them. They went to go find coats. What, like, what can we do? Like, that's what they did, and they constantly have been doing that. And another thing that's really important is that the women are also the mothers of these black and brown people who are dying. And so when we say black lives matter, we're talking about all black lives. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about trans people, people who are differently abled. We're talking about black women, black men, black girls, black boys queer people. We're talking about all of them. And so the women really, um, the women have really held it down and the youth have really held it down. I think one thing that really kept me pushing with this was also seeing other youth like me um, really organizing and being at the forefront of this movement. And a lot of folks are really criticizing young people. Hello? Oh. <laughs> a lot of people have criticized young, young people. Oh, yeah. Okay. So a lot of people have been criticizing young people and talking about um, some of the different strategies that they have taken and that they don't support that. And I think it's very important and very significant that we, we really, like people need to really listen out to the young people. The young people have specifically been marching every single day mm -hmm. and made sure people are constantly reminded of what is going on. And I can just say that the energy of the young people have really generated this fabric of revolution and that people don't realize that. And I think when I saw a lot of young people like me chanting and really pulling their hearts and really just telling everybody what it is and giving it their 100% truth, that is what kept me going. In the video when the SWAT team and the tanks really showed up and were patting their batons and everything, and when they were threatening us and trying to intimidate us, the young people, especially the young black woman, kept saying, get on the sidewalk, keep moving. If you slow down, they're going to get us. And so as people were being scared, which is definitely a thing that we definitely experience, um, the young black woman especially held it down and told folks, you got to keep going. And I just want to put this a reminder that it is not only up to the duties of black and brown people. It is up to the duties as folks who are saying that they're white allies to do the same thing. And I just want to leave it at that note. How do I follow that up? <laughs> uh, my name is Lauren. I'm with DMC again. Um, just to reiterate a little bit on what Sakona and Vanessa have been saying, like Ferguson was a lot of different things. Um, and I think, yeah, as Sakuna was saying, it's beautiful, it's traumatic. You know, I, I feel like um, honored to have been able to go and honored to have been able to witness firsthand what I feel is like my generation's movement um, uh, really um, pick up pace. And um, obviously it's still heartbreaking, um, all of the things that have happened that, you know, have been in the media, uh, that have been happening in Ferguson and elsewhere, and, you know, it's still heartbreaking that after 500 years of <laughs> forced, you know, forced enslavement, of forced oppression, we're still here fighting for our autonomy, our right as human beings to live on this planet without um, being followed or shot at or having housing, you know, there, so it, it was a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things that I um, had noticed and I've been thinking about. One thing mainly is uh, what it means to be outside activists coming into a small community for the weekend um, and then picking up and leaving. Um, and I think that while there were so many beautiful people, the community was really inspiring. Um, you know, Ferguson opened welcomed us with open arms. There was a lot of misguided activism, as there is when any like uh, movement picks up a lot of uh, a lot of steam, becomes like a mainstream thing. You know, Ferguson called 
uh, the nation to action. Um, and so uh, thousands of people flocked to Ferguson, um, including some misguided activists. Um, I remember uh, we were protesting the Rams game um, in St. Louis, and there were a few white Harvard students who were there um, who, were, who were next to me who were talking about being arrested the night before um, and were just completely glorifying their arrest and talking about it like it was some funny story. Um, you know, and one of the kids said, yeah, uh, you know, we didn't think that it was, it was going to be worth it until Cornell West walked in. And then, you know, and then it was like, cool, like, we get to see Cornell West, like, yeah, we got arrested last night, you know? Um, there was also a lot of, um, mis uh, of, like, jumping to take leadership without really asking uh, the organizers who have been there from day one um, doing the work uh, that was just, you know, disrespectful in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that uh, in activist communities and all of our activist communities, there's really a jump to to be a leader. Everybody wants to be a leader, but nobody, a lot of people don't want to put in uh, the behind the scenes work, you know? Um, and so, there, you know, of course, there was like some complications with that. Um, and I also just to, you know, y'all saw um, the marches that Langston recorded uh, that were night marches, and just explaining the difference of, of, like, the presence of white folks, the difference in police reaction was incredible. You know, so we had the the mainstream St. Louis events that were happening throughout the, you know, throughout the week, where um, there were a lot of white folks, a lot of um, a lot of just people in general in the daytime, um, and police really laid off um, during those marches. Um, and of course, that was because the media was there. Um, they didn't want to act up in front of the media, um, which doesn't even say much because it's not like the media has been really portraying um, an accurate description. We interviewed a few uh, w women who had witnessed um, an out-of-town uh, news reporter uh, at the cover doing coverage of the gas station that was burned down after Mike Brown's death. Um, and she was trying to pay and convince to young black men to just pretend like they were looting the store um, and was trying to convince them to just pick up something and she said just look like you're stealing something um, and apparently she was actually caught on video footage um, trying to convince uh, these two black men to to play into you know the nation's idea of what's happening um, so anyway back to my point though um, you know, during these day marches where there were a lot of white folks present, there was, uh, police were laying off, police were like at a distance, but as soon as these night marches started happening, where it was black and brown youth, the tear gas came out, the helicopters came out, the, the shields came out, um, pe people getting pushed down, shoved, pulled, screamed at, um, so really just like, that, that's what y'all saw, is like what happens when the cameras aren't out and what happens when um, white folks aren't present, so. Hey, my name is Khalil. I'm part of the Vanguard movement. Um, I actually went out to Ferguson twice. Um, the first time that I went to Ferguson was with the just the Vanguard movement. Um, it was just one day we just, uh, all of this occurred. And at a Vanguard meeting, a few of us say, let's just go to Ferguson. And two days later, we was in a van traveling to Ferguson, just unexpected. Um, my intentions is the first time that I went there was as a gang specialist for the Vanguard movement. Um, and was trying to figure out ways to unite um, young people uh, out there and to learn uh, from them. Um, and they had inspired many people where Bloods and Crips uh, were teaming up together to fight the cause of oppression, um, which was a very, very beautiful and powerful thing for me to see doing the work that I do uh, in Springfield. Um, but the policing and, and who they protect was just something that was disgusting to me. You know, peaceful protesters out there, you know, fighting for black people, and police are like beating us down. And to realize that if you look it up on YouTube, if anybody never seen a KKK march, um, 
police are actually protecting them. Mm-hmm. Ain't that something? Mm-hmm. And that is not peaceful. Mm-hmm. That's hate. Mm-hmm. So to me, I question myself. You know, what are they trying to protect? Mm-hmm. You know, they were not in the inner city when we went to see that Don Myers. They were protecting. They were protecting certain things, mm-hmm. certain gas stations, mm-hmm. certain businesses, because this is their this is, this is their stuff. You know, destroy your stuff. You know, and our, and our thing is, if, if we burn, you're gonna burn with us. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's just a, a powerful uh, a thing to have experience out there. And, and the timing, the timing was right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you look back at when things were happening with like Rodney King. It was a different culture back then. Mm-hmm. You know, you had songs from like I'm Black and I'm Proud. You had N.W.A. singing after Police. You know, you had you had music that was a culture. You know, now we don't have that, you know, in, in the timing of this, being so vivid, having cameras, um, it was very powerful and, and it's, it has united a lot of people. Um, agitating. That's the way to get things done. Ferguson had to agitate for over almost 200 days before they even thought about, let's just sit down with them and see what they want. You're spending so much money trying to protect something and you don't even, want, you don't even know the problem. But in reality, you just might know the problem. <laughs> but, you know, we don't want to have those kind of talks, do we? Mm-hmm. It's uncomfortable, huh? Yeah. To understand that racism is, like, vivid. For you to say that racism does not exist, and we still have KKK members out in the United States of America? <laughs> just think about that. So agitating is a way that we find uh, most powerful and, and, I, and I realized that yesterday in a meeting, when mom brings a little child to the meeting, and child starts crying and being agitated to the mom. Mom has to leave the meeting. You get things done that way. <laughs> That's why we agitate. All right. Um, what we could do from here is like moving forward is like, you know, as, as BLM 413, we're, we're trying to figure out ways, uh, what does white allies look like? It's, it's very important to understand our role, your role, you know, everybody has a role in this movement. Whether you're a writer, you do media, you know, you're a stay-at-home mom, whoever it is, like there's, there's a place for you if you really sincerely believe this. You, we have to find our role in this. My role may be out there, you know, long hours agitating, you know, being swung at, cars trying to be driven into me. You know, that may be my role. That's what I've been experiencing out there. Your role may be different. You know, it's just try to find your role and, and what does that look like and how you can help this movement, you know. And, and I, I will leave you guys with the reality of like the only way that we're going to be free is the day that black lives are free. And black people are free. All people are free. This, this yeah. is the first time I'm seeing this film. Um, and it just brought me back. Um, I went in October um, with Khalil and Vanessa. And um, the experience of being there and watching is so different Mm -hmm. um and i think that was important for me and for us to do um and to come back and share and so i'm i'm very um honored to have been able to go Mm -hmm. and connect with people um not only from the area but other areas who believe in the same um, things that Black Lives Matter. And um, I think that something that I thought about was um, the symbolism of protesting and marching, especially um, in the evening. Mm-hmm. And things that I've read about, you know, the questions asked, so why, why are you marching or why are you protesting? And, you know, the uncomfortableness of the protesting and um, the loudness um, in, in the night and it's, it's symbolism for waking up, waking people up. You're sleeping and we're gonna wake you up and you're not gonna forget. And um, I think that it's powerful to have gone 
from Ferguson and come home and be out at night waking people up. Um, even if it's just one person that sticks their head out of the window or you know, there's a few people that come down and join, that is important and it is important not to get discouraged when it is only one person because we just keep going and keep reaching people and um, reaching people that probably don't know what's going on and then we teach them and so it just keeps going. And I think that's what's important about organizing and marching and protesting, um, especially at um, night when people are sleeping. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'll, I'll start talking from, from the film and kind of build from there. I think what the film does is provide a really great portrait of, of what the actions look like. Um, it really puts you in there. Um, but one of the things, and I'm just going to be critical of my own film for a second, but one of the things it doesn't show is, is, is a lot of the, the organizing, organizing that like, you know, went on. Um, it's... There was so many. There were so many conversations. There was so much thought, so much energy put into into strategizing, um, and and a, a lot of a lot of um, kind of narratives or storylines that that we hear is that it is unorganized, um, and that is completely untrue. Um, you know, as as outsiders, uh, we came down to to Ferguson. Uh, to to support, um, you know, even though we're we're all brown people, we we still are not from Ferguson, and that that still makes us outsiders. Um, so we went down there to support, and they always had something for us to do. Um, we there was always something for us to help out in whatever way it was, um, and so then bringing that back to kind of like thinking about thinking about allyship, you know, it was our duty now to kind of all the organizers who went down to Ferguson bring it back to where they came from and organize their own people. Um, and so that's what we've been doing since we've come back. Um, but some of us uh, inhabit white spaces, right? So being, being at an institution that is predominantly white, um, you have to think about you know, who's around you. Um, and we've talked about white allyship and, and white resources. And thinking about white people have access to resources, and if they really want to support us and support the work that we're doing, then they have to be willing to to give up their resources and give as many resources as they can to us, so we can do the work that we need to do. And I think I'll leave it at that. Hello. Um, for me, watching the film back, I think everyone touched on perfect um, themes and topics. But I think for me it's very traumatic to see and like really really lift that, uh, at least for me. Um, but I think I just want to point out that like, again, as Sakona said um, earlier, Vanessa, is that like, we remember these people because people are everyday fighting. Like right now, people are on the grounds and on the front lines again and again and again in each day fighting. And they've, we've been fighting for the last past 500 years. And I think this is something very important is that like sometimes oftentimes we need we we have to see media formats in order to realize, you know, that human beings are dying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that that's something really important because it really frames how like the media and like white supremacy tries to separate, you know, black lives from being human beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's something very important um, that's not often talked about. And seeing how, like, it's just like um, globally, people of color are displaced, uh, even in our domestic, you know, terrorism state that we are right here, and also in foreign states. And how we have to see, you know, our, like, you know, Facebook updates on seeing, like, oh, someone's being, like, you know, there's a video out there. And I think it's important that, like, we have to um, see, like, see beyond like the statistics and number. Realize, you know, these people are dying. They're human beings, and these numbers are always there, and they have always been there. And so, what does that what does that mean for you to for you to like 
begin to understand that, like, to begin to comp like understand that these people are, you know, black and brown people, not just, um, you know, just not men also, because that's oftentimes that, like, there's more of the statistics that are showing, you know, um, black men are dying, but it's also trans women and, like, black women that aren't often talked about, and let's talk about that, like, you know, other different marginalized communities and um, seeing, you know, that and, um, and bringing them right here in our communities because that's what's happening here too. It's a global issue and um, I think that's all I wanna talk about. So I wanted to talk for a minute about how Black Lives Matter started. Um, so Black Lives Matter, the hashtag, was created by Patrice, um, Alicia, and Opal following the assassination of Trayvon Martin. Um, and um, these three um, black women, two queer black women, one black, black woman came together um, and started this, this like Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and after, um, after Mike Brown was killed, um, this like was something that became like nationally and then internationally kind of like known and talked about. Um, so I wanted to, I guess, first just like give love to them for a second and recall that yes, like it is black women who have been at the forefront of this. Um, but also just kind of touch on a little bit of the other kind of factors that um, Black Lives Matter is talking about and that we're talking about. Um, and then I think in a few minutes we can break and then come back and do Q&A and do some more dialogue if people feel on board with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so... So, um, like, one of the things um, that was, like, interesting to know when we were in Ferguson and seeing all of these bear cats and helicopters and hundreds of police officers um, and snipers um, was that, like, in 2014, like, the U.S. food stamps budget, $8 billion was cut, like, nationally. And, like, in those first few months, over a million dollars in extra military gear was sent to Ferguson. Um, to shoot and incarcerate black and brown people who were saying black lives matter. Um, so that's like, so that's been a really like concrete um, piece that we're talking about the money that is going to militarism in this country. Um, these like crazy overfunded police forces. Um, so in Massachusetts, we have a $500 million bond to build more prisons. Um, and um, some of you may have seen like the Valley Advocate the other week tased and confused. So Springfield Police Department is investing in 22 new tasers. And when I met with the police commissioner, he told me that they were um, going to take a while to get here um, because tasers in the country are in back order because Los Angeles just ordered 4,000. Um, so we talk about the fact that there are 2.8 million people currently incarcerated in this country. Over 60% of them are black and Latino men. Uh, over 60% of which are black and Latino men. Um, we talk about the very well-funded destruction um, and, um, and separation and disintegration of black and brown communities um, who are funneled into, I think, you know, after Trayvon Martin was killed with the Dream Defenders, what people were talking about a lot in Florida was the school-to-prison pipeline. Um, we see that the money is going um, to fund more police officers but not more schools. Um, we see that, like, there's no money for food stamps, but um, there's money for new tasers. Um, so it's not even a question, I think. It's just an obvious fact at this point where the priorities and where the government budget priorities lie in this country. Um, so all of those kind of set the undertone so that when a black person is shot in this country, which happened in 2014 every 28 hours, which is happening this year at a more rapid rate because as of yesterday, 109 people had been killed by police in 2015. Um, so these, these create the conditions, right? So that like Ferguson seems like some kind of anomaly because people don't go home. But you know, Darren Wilson shot Mike Brown six times and there was no indictment. But two weeks ago, Ayanna Jones, a seven-year-old who was killed in her bed while she was sleeping in Detroit, the charges were just dismissed against this officer. So it's like not only are these people being funded and paid, but the justice system has no interest in, um, in justice, <laughs> um, which is why direct action is so important. 
um, it's just like exposing that and it's like a really important step because um, because and, and like so not only is Darren Wilson not in jail but he's like a retired celebrity millionaire mm -hmm. Um, Daniel Pantaleo, who choked Eric Garner to death on video, um, is just like a celebrity. Like nothing happened to these people. Um, so I guess I just wanted to to touch on that. So I wanted to touch a little bit about um, being here. Um, like this is an issue, um, but we were actually brought here. You know, black people were actually brought here. You were enslaved here. You lynched us and left us up there for hours so we could watch. So when you see actions like what happened to Mike Brown and him being left out there for four and a half hours, mm -hmm. go back a couple centuries and reflect. Does it look the same? You gotta catch on to these methods that they're using. You know, they say that our young people are killing each other. Who taught them violence? Where did they learn that from? Mm -hmm. Watching you lynching their fathers. These are things that we need to ask, like ask ourselves, you know, and how can we help? Um, if you look at statistics now, the murder rate from the 90s has went down. Mm -hmm. So why more policing? Mm -hmm. And why are blacks described as monsters? Mm -hmm. Dehumanized. If you watched the interview by Daryl Wilson, how he described our beloved brother as a monster who had demons in him, and he had to shoot him. He just had to. So that is the that is that is how the media portrays us, and and it's feeding it to you. Don't be scared of me because I'm a, a man of color. I have love. I have children. You know. These are things that I worry about, even as a young father. Are my children next? It's my son. I remember going to the store to buy archery equipment, and my son went to go pick up a pellet gun because it was in the section, and I freaked out. He <laughs> pictured that. You know, how, what kind of conversation am I supposed to have with my son about this? That it's not safe, that he's not safe, that he has to be careful. He can't do or behave like a white kid does in his neighborhood and play. Because his playing may be considered as a demon who's possessed and I have to shoot him. So these are questions that arise in, in my young mind and, and like, how do we discuss this? And I know it's uncomfortable sometimes, like, wow, that, that really happens. You know, so getting this raw footage of going to Ferguson it was just raw, you know, and coming back, it, I could probably speak for all of us to say that we were depressed. Mm -hmm. Leaving our young brothers and sisters over there and knowing that it's a major struggle in there in the front, front, front lines. Mm -hmm. And so how can we help here? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, speaking on what Vanessa and Khalil have been talking about on um, connecting past oppression with current oppression within black communities, just to give a general statistic for y'all, there are currently more black men in the United States incarcerated than there were enslaved in 1850. And black women are the fastest growing sector of the incarcerated population. This is neo-slavery. Slavery has not left us. Oppression has not left us. This isn't something that is an isolated incident. These are all connected. These are all new, this is a new form of maintaining white supremacy. And in order to understand anything else, you have to understand that. And we have to be able to examine systemic racism and institutionalized racism and understand what that is. Also understanding that racism is more than just calling, like saying the N-word, that's, that's not, racism is prejudice and power and having the power to marginalize people and understanding how racism affects black and brown bodies and how black and brown bodies since their inception into this country have been seen 
as a source of profit. And that's currently what's happening with the policing. The policing of black bodies leads to the incarceration of black bodies, which leads to the taking of autonomy for black and brown bodies. You know, um, and so it's it's so important to connect those and to be able to understand that on a deeper level because we have to understand this at the root. Otherwise, we're just going to be walking around dazed and confused and not understanding and being surprised when Mike Brown happens, when Von Derrick Myers happens, when Eric Garner and Ayanna Jones happen. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, these aren't isolated incidents. This is, this is the foundation of this country, so. And uh, another, another one of the things that we've been trying to work around as well on a national level, just received this information yesterday is it's very powerful because it's been on the table for quite some time is that uh, we have to start teaching ourselves our own history mm -hmm. you know we've been taught that we were slaves and just that we were more than that so um for ourselves to be better organizers like you know we need to know about us our history um so that's that's also very important i just wanted to throw that out there yeah of some of the things that are going to be said, the demands are high, and, and it's very important that we know our history because um, our babies matter, um, and it starts at home. So I'm going to let Vanessa just read out the 12-point platform of the Vanguard movement um, that was actually created by my big brother, um, an incarcerated man who'd been through many systems from child services to juvenile detentions to the state penitentiary and seeing the system firsthand of being in it and trapped and, and finding ways to better educate himself so that he can save his babies and our babies. The Vanguard Movement. Together united will never be divided. We will not fight with, kill, oppress, or even hinder other people of color in the world who, like black people, are being brutalized, victimized, massacred, and liquidated by the white racist government of America. We are speaking from an indigenous immigrant African perspective as people who are still living with the ramifications of displacement and diaspora. What we want now. We want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black community. We want equality for all women. We want full employment for our people. We want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. We want education for our people that is rooted in historical accuracy, which exposes the horrors of colonization, slavery, and displacement. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We want all black people and immigrants to be exempt from military service. We want an immediate end to police terror and murder of black people. We want freedom for all black and Latino men and women held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails and immigration detainment centers. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. We demand an end to white supremacy. White people, you need to own your racism. Accept it, move on and work with other white people to dismantle their own racism. This is your role. We believe in the right to self-defense. We recognize that the continent of Turtle Island, aka North America, aka the Americas, was founded on the genocide of the traditional peoples of this continent, and its wealth and institutions were amassed by the forced slave labor of over 60 million African people who were taken captive and made to work here. Due to this extensive history of genocide and enslavement, one group of people has amassed resources, while the other has faced exclusion from these resources. Lack of wealth, lack of accurate representation, etc. If we are not addressing and deconstructing the privilege and power dynamics in each space, we are incapable of moving forward and are, in fact, replicating the same power hierarchies of a top-down, patriarchal, authoritative position that has been impressed on us from the beginning of colonization rather than equality, where humans are respected and given a spatial entitlement to our shared history. Palante.